Have you ever heard someone say ignorance is bliss? It's a weird expression when you deconstruct it, and in today's video we're going to look at power, social structure, and why some people can't afford bliss. It's all a part of your introduction to religious studies, and it's coming up right now. Admittedly, one of the more difficult things about the academic study of religion is that many of the terms that we use for sophisticated purposes have usage in popular conversation as well. The problem with this is that if we apply a popular meaning to our scholarly purposes, we can end up in a load of trouble. People have all sorts of understandings of religion, but if we apply those when we're studying religion, we're bound to mess up the insider-outsider problem. Similarly, we know that power is not a thing, but people essentialize power all the time. For the social theorist or the scholar of religion, power is better understood as a relationship. And if you want to understand how society works, you have to begin to understand how that relationship plays out and how to measure it. Now, the idea of measuring power and measuring relationships isn't actually all that strange. Think about cars. We talk about horsepower all the time. Horsepower is a term used to reference power. Power not as a thing, but power as a relationship. Power as an ability to do work. In the 19th century, a Scottish engineer by the name of James Watt, as in the Watt, came up with the term horsepower to convey to people how an engine could do the same amount of work as a horse. He said, if a horse can pull this piece of mass one meter upward from the ground for one second, this engine can do the same thing. Similarly, we can say that this engine has X amount of horsepower because it can do what a horse can do this many times. So horsepower is a unit of an engine's ability to perform a certain task. Similarly, as scholars of religion, we have a term to measure work, to measure power. And that term is discourse. Discourse for us means expression with effect. I'm going to say that again and say it with me this time. Discourse for us means expression with effect. Discourse is the ability for a person to impose their will given what they say or communicate to others in the world around them. Think about it this way. You have a vested interest in studying for this class. And if your friend says to you, make sure that you study X because it's going to be on the test, that might carry a lot of weight, right? But it's way more impactful if I, as your professor, say, study Y because it's on the test. I, being closer to the structures of this class, how it's created, what is to be expected, what is going to have weight, that's going to carry far more than your friend, even as well-intentioned as your friend may be, even if your friend paid attention to the class. I'm the authority. I have power or, rather, can do more work in this situation than your classmate can. This is what we mean by discourse. Certain expressions can have more or less effect in a social situation. So when we are studying people, we want to observe discourse. We want to observe how expressions are having an effect. So why does discourse matter? The 19th century sociologist Emile Durkheim said that one's power is related to one's proximity to the engines of social structure. This is because the world as we know is the result of social relationships that are replicated over and over and over again. This is called social reproduction. And that's a useful phrase because it reminds us that our social constructions, the ones that we take for granted, are re the result of classification and essentializing that we repeat again and again and again. It's not just that words make worlds, it's the way that our words are used over and over and over again to make those worlds. It's the way that what one has said is very relevant to the social facts upon which we make sense of the world and take it for granted. This idea is called naturalization. 
And we see it with machines. We see it with engines. We don't have to know how they work to know that they work. They just do because their processes seem to be proven over time to work again and again and again, and we can come to depend upon them. When we talk about work or discourse in social theory, we have to be cognizant not only of these naturalized expressions, but also the charged effects that come with them. Because we as scholars of religion know about the history of cultural chauvinism, well-meaning and sophisticated definitions that have been used to make sense of the world, but have also been used to evaluate people for better or worse, good, bad, and ugly. We know that classification is a political act. We know that essentialism shapes our understanding of social roles, especially if we look back at Martin's deconstruction of how essentialism works. All this to say that words make worlds and we have to take stock of who and what are impacted by those words and the people behind them. When a group is continually oppressed or put down by the social constructions at play, we are talking about domination. When the world as naturalized seems to disadvantage people, that is domination. And so as scholars of religion and people who are trying to understand how society works, we need to understand how words make worlds, how those words replicated become the social constructions that we naturalize and take for granted, and how there's a social hierarchy at play in the worlds that we've, cre that we've created, for better or worse, and that's domination. And all of this is the product of people acting, people engaged in discourse, and the social structures that emerge from those discourses. Now, I understand that my discussion of discourse and social structures probably had a uh, seemingly negative tinge to it, but let me be clear about a few things. Um, yes, our social structures can have negative ramifications on people, right? The whole point of our understanding of discourse, or at least one aspect of our understanding of discourse, is that the effects of our expressions are varied based upon people within a same, in the same structure. That is to say that one person's good effect could be another person's bad effect. Now, our job as scholars of religion is not to um, label a social structure as good or bad, but rather we need to understand the varied ways, the different ways in which people's expressions um, have effect on different people. We want to take stock of people's expressions, we want to take stock of people's effects, and recognize that um, as a result of the discourses at play, people are moved within a social structure, up and down a high ladder of hierarchy, but also in different places in relationship to each other. This is how communities are formed. This is how communities are broken. So to understand how this works, we need to look at a scholar by the name of Peter Berger. Because Peter Berger was very much interested in the construction of reality. His project um, as a sociologist of the 20th century was the social construction of religion, but also reality. And both of those terms get used for him because he understood religion to be a discourse that defined people's reality. That when people talk about how the world is, they often would result to uh, discussions of religion, expressions that had to do with the history of religions. Now, as a result of this sort of inquiry, he observed that part of the reason why our social structures are so fixed, even when we recognize that there are problems created by those structures, um, at least from the perspective of dominated people, is because of a three-part process in the social construction of reality. He said social structures emerge because of a three-part process that I'm gonna draw here on the whiteboard and I want you to follow it with me. It's a sort of relationship that happens um, and I think as I use examples as we go, you'll be able to see why social structures are often so fixed. Um, I like to think about this in terms of a triangle. Oops, okay, there we go. 
More or less, that's a triangle, okay? And so on the first side of this triangle, he talked about the way that um, a social agent or a person will classify or essentialize, label, observe the world around them, okay? And he called this internalization. Okay, internalization. Internalization is how people see the world around them, how they perceive it. And I'm gonna draw a little eyeball here. Um, there you go, right? This is people's, uh, one might say, uh, perception or purview, how they observe the world around them. And it often has to do with like labels, as I mentioned before. Um, Berger noted too, that there was this other part of the process called externalization. And it's the way people look to sources, right? This is my book here. Um, it's the way people look to others, right? Um, to make sense of the world around them for a confirmation of how they perceive the world. So let me give you an example of how this works. With internalization, you might have someone say, wow, this teacher is really wise. This teacher is really smart. This person is ugly. This person is a problem. Those people are cursed. Those people are blessed. They internally may truly believe at the heart of who they are that this is how the world is. Externalization is when someone looks to an outside source to confirm what they are perceiving or observing, right? This is their, the evidence that they draw upon. We see this happen with scriptures. We see this happen with communities. We see this happen with the news. We see this happen with school, right? It's going to another source outside of yourself to get information to help you make sense of that which you're internalizing. Now, one way to think about this, given what we've read in Martin so far, is that internalization has to, if internalization has to do with labels, Externalization has to do with the additional characteristics. Remember how in Martin's chart, um, he uses the idea of um, labels to make sense of how people essentialize, and then people will draw upon all these additional characteristics, this baggage to uh, affirm their internalization or affirm their label. This is another way of breaking down that same process. So you have the label, which is internalization. You have externalization, which are the additional characteristics. What we are trying to do when we understand um, discourse is why do these structures work that fits people's roles in society? And Berger would say that in addition to internalization and externalization, we have this other thing called objectification. Object, or objectivizing is actually what he says. Rather, rather than objectification um, in the negative parlance it's used, he uses the term objectivizing or objectivization, um, objectivization to talk about the way that um, our social constructions take on a life of their own. What he says is that um, things start to speak for themselves. Um, running out of whiteboard space here. Um, people begin to start to speak for themselves. Objectivization is when the things that we've constructed seem to have a life that exists beyond the process we just described. The teacher is wise because they are essentially wise. And it has nothing to do with me um, it has nothing to do with any source. It's just how it is. The sources just help us see it, right? Think about this with um, prophets. A prophet's just someone who says something that they think is important, right? They've internalized it as being meaningful or significant. But then those prophets write down those, those observations or um, labels or ideas into books, they give testimony, they preach sermons, and then other people write those down and record them for posterity. And other people say, that prophet surely is something, they know things, they're smart, they're wise, they're powerful. And then objectivization is the idea that that prophet just unequivocally um, 
beyond anyone's personal viewpoint, is just wise and smart and should be taken um, as someone of interest, taken as someone who is significant and important. Let's put it a different way. Let's put a, a seemingly emic negative spin on this. That person over there is a problem, or those people over there are a problem. Internalization. Externalization. Here's why they're a problem. Um, if you have them do this test, this test proves they're a problem or unsavory, stupid, ugly, you name negative characteristic here. Um, my friends think they're a problem. Um, my friend knows this story about how these bad people did this one thing this one time, and thus they're all bad. Um, the uh, history shows me that these people are bad because I can put on a timeline all the bad things they've done. Um, I have these charts, right? That's all externalization. Objectivization is just saying, this is how the world is. This is how they are. Some people are good. Some people are bad. Those people are bad. We thus, by default, are probably good or at least okay. And that's just objectively how it is. It can't be questioned or argued. You've seen how this works, right? And you see how this works because this is what goes on with discourse, at least the discourses that become reality, right? Think about it. Race, gender, sexuality, religion, ability slash disability, right? Um, all of those are discourses that involve internalization, externalization, and objectivization. And Peter Berger says we need to slow our roll and break down how this works. With Berger and Martin, you get tools to break this down to deconstruct the realities around us and the structures that are at play that help us understand the social roles that we all occupy in our world, but also how we got to occupy those world, those roles in the first place.